Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri in the USA. Well, today we've got a Commodore 64 and this is a special one. This is going to be a gift for my nephew. I spent a lot of time over at his house uh, when he was young and I was in high school and they had a C64 and I had one at home. So we did a lot on these machines back in the day. And I heard he would like to get one and maybe learn a little bit about programming. So I said, okay, Uncle Jeff to the rescue. We'll get you set up with the C64. Now we saw the Kevin Autumn power supply in a Ferengi Friday a month or so ago. That's going to go on this machine. But before we plug it right in, we need to check it out to make sure it's safe to power up. So that's what we'll start on. Let's get right to it. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. They do circuit boards of all sizes, small circuit boards, medium circuit boards. They can even assemble them for you. So head on over to PCBWay and get your free instant quote. Now they're offering an upgrade from TG130 to TG150 temperature rating for free. Well, I guess first things first is to get cover off of this thing. Now, I didn't notice that before. This particular machine has a serial number scratched into it. So I wonder if this was from a school or something like that originally. I've got a piece of rubber added in this corner, but it was in good physical shape. So that's why I grabbed it out of the stash. Serial number RP0095397. Made in the US of A. Alright, so carefully rotate this up. So to try to save the tabs if they're not already broken. There we go. Okay. Yay, all three tabs are intact, so we don't have to fix those. Looks clean, a little yellow on the tape. Maybe this was in a smoking environment. Can't really tell by the sniff test. It may have been enough years ago. Yeah, a little dusty on the inside. Got a red sticker there. Okay, this is a 250425. It's a later board. Doesn't have the can. Alright, so go ahead and get the board out of the bottom case. I'm curiously here, all these chips have heat sink goop on them makes me think they are not original to this board. Now, first three things. Or, there you go, so you can see my fingers. First three things. Power, clock, and reset. PCR. So, to check power. First thing we're going to do is make sure we don't have any short circuits. So I will put my ohm meter on ohms here and on each side of these regulators, input and output side. We will check resistance. Okay, there's something there. It's not a short or a very low ohm reading. So it's probably okay. It doesn't mean it works. It just means that we're not measuring a short circuit. Okay. So one of these will take the 9 volt AC and convert it to 5 volts. And the other, through a little other circuit here, will convert it to 9 or 12 volts. This one's 12 volts for the... Uh, said chip, I believe. 
and we can measure across. Let me get that meter back in there where you can see it, hopefully, with all the reflections. I'm just going to measure across one of the 7400 series chips, which is the 5 volt rail that's coming from the power supply. And yeah, we've got a couple K there. It's not shorted out. So we should be okay to go ahead and apply power to this guy. And we'll measure five volts on the chips. We'll measure 12 volt and five volt output here. And if that's okay, we'll hook it up to the monitor and see if it's working. Okay, we've got our Kevin Autumn power supply hooked up to our C64 board. And yes, I do have my multimeter sitting right on top of the circuit board, but it's in this rubber baby bubby buggy bumper. Easy for me to say, so it's not going to cause any problems. So I will uh, turn on the power supply. It is lit up, as you can see here. And then we will turn on the C64 board, and I'm going to grab a ground here first. Okay. And I need to put the voltmeter on volts. Turn that on. We'll measure the high pin of one of the 7400 series chips. And I just lost my connection. Now I'm making good contact with my probe. So we have our five volts from the power supply. And we'll measure uh, input to the regulator, output of the regulator, 12 volts, that's pretty good. Input, output, five volts, okay. So we know our power's good, so chances are we might have some life coming from this thing. So we will go ahead and hook it up to the monitor now, just to see what happens. Okay, bit of an odd angle here, but this way we can both see the board, we can both see the monitor, and I've got my homemade S-Video cable here, which I did a video on. I will link that down below in case you want to make one. This is made with all off-the-shelf stuff in an off-the-shelf enclosure, so it's easy to replicate. Um, okay, so I've got... The power supply left on. I'm going to go ahead and kick on the C64 now and we'll see if we get anything on the screen. And I see nothing. Okay. Input 3 is telling us we've got a signal. We're back. It's working. I didn't do anything special. I just plugged in the VGA cable from the Xtron scaler uh, to the monitor. Um, it goes from a uh, the Xtron to a splitter to the monitor and to the capture device. And I just had that cable unplugged because I had been using it for something else recently. Um, at any rate, we've got a picture and it's a pretty decent picture. Uh, typical, you know, C64 kind of banding type of thing, uh, which is a little different if you're on NTSC or PAL. Does it mean it's all working though? Um, we're at the point now where it seems to be functioning, so we'll go ahead and get the test harness and hook that up, and that will allow us to do an automated test of the rest of the system. And um, then we'll go from there. If it hadn't been working at this point, then we'll dig into, um, we check the power, and then we move into clock and reset. We'd make sure we have a clock signal. This has got the 8701 chip and reduced chip count in here. It just uses the 8701, and it feeds the VIC-2. Um, so we would have checked the clock if we had the clock, uh, we check the reset circuit to make sure that it's resetting properly. And then we would have moved on to checking the address bus and things like that. But for right now, I'll get the test harness. We'll hook that up and we'll see what happens. Okay. We've got our dead test set up, uh, hooked up. This is the one by Sven Peterson. I will put the link below. Contact him if you're interested in the one. I think they're awesome. And I've got the capture card going too, so we should be able to kick this on and see how the test does. And I better put my glasses on so I can read the screen up there. It's 
so it's shown us that we have the 4066, which is an analog switch. That U28 is bad. So I will let this run through a few more test cycles and I will grab the documentation for the, the Commodore documentation for the test harness and we'll see if it has any more information about that particular failure. I've let this run for a while and sometimes it'll come up and say the control port is fine and sometimes it'll fail. I am seeing like right now it says it's okay, but it has failed on a previous test. I'm guessing this has to do with a pot input. Uh, the test here can be kind of flaky. It depends exactly on the resistors that's in the test harness, um, as well as the capacitors that are on the SID and we could have a, a bad connection here too. So I'm not super worried about it at this point. We'll go ahead and clean this board up. We'll re-socket all the chips. We'll check all the soldering on the back, that type of thing. And then we'll give it another test. People go to all sorts of effort to try to remove this RF shield and, you know, with cutters and damage things. And it's really not that difficult. I've got a nice white tip on my soldering iron. I'm going to apply just a little bit of fresh solder to that. You want that white tip to get the whole thing hot. Let it heat up for a few seconds. I've got a small screwdriver here and I'm going to pry that out. Bingo. That's all there is to it. It is not difficult. It is uh, not time consuming. And then I'll go around and suck up this old solder here on these points so I can re-solder it when I'm done. So I'll do that with the rest of this uh, shield. We'll take it off there and we'll have a look at the back of the board. Well, we've got our RF shield off of there. Um, this top side of the board looks pretty good. I'll take this loose and put some more thermal compound under this heat sink. Clean it off the tops of all of these uh, chips that are in sockets and re-socket them and make sure the sockets look okay, that type of thing. There's some dust bunnies everywhere, so I'll blow that off with the air compressor. Uh, on the back side of the board, I looked real close at all these socketed chips, and I believe these are fitted from the factory. The soldering is very even. There's not too much solder. Uh, all the pins are trimmed evenly across all the sockets. So that looks like it was done by a machine. Now, there's one chip here which may have been replaced. At one time, the pins are a little longer. It's kind of hard to to say yeah I would say that's been reworked at some point just judging by the solder it's not bad but it's different there's another one here and here yeah it's got some uh, mismatched RAM in it so it's had some work done on the RAM in the past yeah we can kind of see that the the soldering uh, job is good you know but the pins are uneven from each other that type of thing whereas all the socketed chips the sockets are all nice and even. I also want to clean up this flux residue. It's just there from the factory. It's not hurting anything. It's just uh, nasty looking. And on the power switch, it's not uncommon to have these back two pins not soldered in because they're not used. But I will go ahead and solder those. It's good for mechanical stability. Uh, these have really thick traces and you'll notice that the solder doesn't tend to come through to the top of the board. You can also operate this switch slowly and feel it. If it feels sticky or hesitant, it's a good sign the switch is dirty and you might need to clean it or replace it. This one is fine. So I'm going to go blow the dust bunnies off of this board now. And we'll clean up all of this uh, flux, that type of thing. Check out the chips and do some resoldering on the power switch. A little alcohol and a toothbrush and we'll clean up those dirty flexi areas. We'll put a clean rag over that and scrub on top of the rack to pick all that stuff up off of the board. We'll go ahead and re-solder the power switch. I'm leaving the iron on each pad for an extended period of time uh, because of the amount of mass in the traces and in the leads of the power switch. I'll give everything a good once over under the lighted magnifier and touch up any solder points that need it. Now we'll get that heat sink compound cleaned off of all the chips. We don't need it there because there's no heat sinks. 
I'll go ahead and pull this heat sink up and replace the thermal compound and then reinstall it. We'll make sure all these socketed chips are fully seated by pulling them part of the way out and then plugging them back in. I'll use an eraser to carefully clean the gold uh, card edge connections and then I'll wipe that down with some alcohol. Got the test harness hooked back up and you'll notice it's showing us uh, the E1 is bad as well as the same 4066 um, E28. Uh, both of those are related in uh, the joystick reading I believe so I think what I'll do is check that U1 is seated correctly. Um, both U1 and uh, U2, yes, they're the 6526s. Um, we can swap those to see if that problem description changes. I've got the board shut off. I wanted to make sure I shut off the power supply too. Never hurts to be doubly sure. All right. And well, all our pins look okie dokie. And if we still have the same problem, then we'll swap the 6526s uh, E1 and U2. And we'll try it again since they're both socketed. That's a real quick, easy test. The eagle eye among you may have noticed that I left out the serial loopback dongle in here, which was part of the reason for the, the problems that we were seeing in the test. And I popped that in there. I ran it again. It took about eight minutes before it popped up a bad U28. So I'm thinking that might just be a connection problem or we might just be right on the edge of the resistor values versus the, the SID values. Um, if it's a connection issue with that 6526 I might be able to improve that with some deoxid so I'll try that. Um, other than that I think I will run a little program to test the joystick and paddle inputs and see what that looks like before I button this board up. In order to test the joysticks and pot inputs to confirm my suspicion that everything is actually okay, I first used just a generic joystick test program and plug joysticks in, everything was fine. I don't have any paddles though. So I soldered up this little pigtail here that gives me access to both pot inputs and the five volts, which is common. I've got my Ohmite oh resistor decade box set up at 500K now. The uh, paddles on the Commodore are 470K. And I've got this hooked up to input number one right now. I'm running a, a program. It's a basic program. I'll put a link to it on my GitHub in the description below. I wrote this when I was investigating uh, how the pot inputs on these old computers work. I will put a link to that video below as well. At any rate, I've tested out the number one input and it works fine, so we'll move to number two input and we will try it out and see what happens. So we need to move this little plug over. This is just female DB9 with three wires soldered onto it. Plug that guy in, and I am on the X pot input. And so what I'll do right now, this is set at 500K. I'll turn it down one notch to 400K, and we should see the BX uh, above change, I believe. I don't remember my nomenclature for the screen with this program. Okay, so now I will run it down to 400K. Yep, we exchanged a little, 300K, 200K. And you notice the reading's changing a little bit. That's fine. I'm this not With this version of the program, I'm not averaging these readings. So you'll see a bit of fluctuation. 
100k and a dead short and that goes to zero so that's working as expected there's nothing wrong with that 4066 i think but we will try the y input to confirm okay this will be the by on the screen we're at 500k which is essentially open 400k 300k 200k 100k and zero and if you've noticed the difference between the readings at each resistance setting uh, it is not linear that is the way it works in 500k which is essentially open so okay so this input works um, that is an artifact of how the test is done for the paddle inputs um, Commodore used a very oddly sized resistor and even though I put a resistor in the test harness that is very very close um, it can be just a little off and give you false problem readings like this but we can test for it so no big deal well now that we've got our board cleaned up we've got everything tested I even dug out uh, a fast load cart to send along with this to my nephew um, we still need to do something about this nasty, dirty case, and the keyboard is not working very well. It needs to be cleaned. So that will be the next bit of business after we solder the RF shield back on the board. Let's get that done real quick, and then we'll do the cosmetic bits of this. I'll first clean up all the blobs of solder that are left on the RF shield using the solder sucker, and I'll straighten them with a small pair of pliers. And then I'll put it back on the board, bend them over, and re-solder them where they were originally. There's no point in not doing this. The RF shield was put there for a reason. One of the first steps in taking the keyboard apart is to desolder the caps lock wires. Then we'll take out the 11 Phillips screws that hold the keyboard into the top cover. This isn't difficult. Uh, be sure to inspect the post that the screws go into. Those are quite often cracked. I'll go ahead and pop the power LED out of the case to make the case easier to wash later on. Before pulling the circuit board off of the keyboard, I will pull the keys off and dunk the keycaps in this warm, soapy water. So I've got my keyboard puller here. Yeah, they're kind of yellow on the inside too. This may have been belonging to a smoker at one point in time. I think the biggest thing to keep track of here is the metal bale that goes on the space bar. And the space bar uses a different spring. Other than that, it's not real complicated or exciting. You just carefully pull each key up with your keycap puller and dunk it in the water. And if it's an odd keyboard you don't already have a picture of or sample of to know the key positions, then take a picture first. That's all there is to it. Now that we've got all our keycaps off and springs off of here, I'm going to go ahead and clean up the inside. The three of these screws are kind of trapped under this tape. So what I like to do just create a little U-shaped cut in the tape well, but this particular tape is brittle enough I might wind up replacing it anyhow usually it's not so brittle and you can just peel that back although this is cracking you can peel back the flaps and get to the screw and everything is fine so all we have to do is take out these 1.21 giga screws. To reveal the inside of the keyboard. Okie dokie, down to two screws. There we go. We'll pull this off. And this is one of the nice gold-coated keyboards. 
actually this is nice and shiny that is in good shape so I think we'll just wipe this off with some alcohol and wipe off our plungers and test each one on the key tester to make sure they are all okay and then we'll put it back together yeah looking at this sideways i can see just a tiny bit of dirt on some of the keys so i'm going to set this part to the side carefully It's hard to say how much that's picking up. Get the function keys. Now all of these plungers are the same and I want to clean up this frame really good because it's really dirty on the other side. So I'm just going to dump them out like that and you can see how dirty this guy is. So I'll take it to the sink and clean it and dry it off and for all of these guys i'm going to take my rag just kind of wipe them off wipe the rubber part with a little alcohol and do each one of those and then we'll test them Again, not very exciting or glamorous, but it is worthwhile to do. So your keyboard works nice. So I got all the key stems cleaned up and I got out my key tester. I built this for the investigation I did on uh, rejuvenating this uh, conductor rubber. Um, I'll put the link to that video below and I still have some of these boards in stock. If you'd like to get one, you can get it with or without the 3D printed part. Uh, link in the description below. At any rate, we just hook this up to our meter and pop the key in the C64 side, push down lightly, and about 56 ohms. That's really good. Um, on the C64, a few hundred ohms is pretty typical. Less than 1K will still work. Higher than that, you need some rejuvenation. Uh, see the video I talked about. So I am just going to test the rest of these keys to make sure they're okay. Yeah, 70 ohms, that's fine. And uh, I already wash the frame they go in, and when that's dry, we'll pop this keyboard. Oh, i got to clean the keycaps. We've got to clean the keycaps too, and then we'll put the keyboard back together. Here is our highly technical keycap cleaning. Take them from the soapy water, give them a bit of a scrub with a toothbrush, and put them in some clear water. Now the tops of these looked very, very yellow before, and just after soaking in some soapy water for an hour or so, they have come just about back to uh, the brand new white color. So I really think this thing was used by a smoker before. I don't know how else those would have gotten that yellow. Even the back of the keycaps was a little yellow. So when I'm done scrubbing all of these, I will uh, take them into the bathroom, give them a final rinse with some warm water, take them out to the garage and um, blow them dry with the air compressor that'll get most of the water out of the nooks and crannies. I'll lay them out on a towel in another room and let them sit there you know, overnight to finish drying before fully reassembling the keyboard. We got all the plungers back in there. And because of our pieces of wood, they are sitting down in there most of the way. We don't have to worry about them popping out like they did before. If these were, this was a little longer, maybe two inches, that'd be a little better. But that is better than nothing. We'll put our clean circuit board on here. There we go. This has here and here and here and here there are some nubs that keep it into position remember about your wires here that we'll have to solder in there later and one top tip here 
So whenever you're putting screws back into plastic, whenever you're putting screws back into plastic, just set it in there, rotate it slightly counterclockwise. You hear that little click there? That is the screw dropping into the original thread, so we're not cutting new threads. And we will preserve our plastic for a little while longer. And I'll just get them all started and then, and then uh, torque them up. Then we'll get our switch wires soldered on here. And I took that nasty piece of yellow tape off of there and we'll put a piece of packing tape across there and it'll look just like factory. So what goes up must come down and what came apart must be put back together. Or that's the theory anyhow. So I've laid out our keys in order. That makes it easier. few springs on and now we'll just snap the old keycaps right back into position. Alright. And now, of course, we are going to wash the case in my uber spacious bathroom here. Just some soapy water. And an old toothbrush. We'll get most of the dirt off of there. And then we'll worry about the sticky stuff. And maybe follow it up with a magic eraser. Now with all the dirt off the case, I'm going to work on this goo. I've got a little WD-40 in a container here. And I'll just rub that on there and let it sit for a while. And keep working on that. To get all that off there and then we'll go back into the sink and uh, get the WD-40 remnants off of there and clean up any scuffs with the Magic Eraser. So we got our case all cleaned up. Just need to put things back together. And the only thing I really need to do to it was glue in some new mounting post for the PCB. I came up with a kit for this years ago while refurbishing machine. I did a video on that and I will, well, instead of linking a bunch of separate videos I've referenced in this video, I'll create a playlist and in the description down below, I will link to that playlist so you'll have easy access to all those videos. Um, the other thing I did was file down this edge of these tabs in this top edge of these sockets. And now the case just drops together without any eerie sounding creaks and it'll keep those tabs from breaking in the future. So now I'll just go ahead and pop this guy back together and we'll test it out again. Now we'll install the circuit board in the bottom half of the case using the seven original screws and including the cardboard RF shield. Just to gild the lily, I'll use some self-adhesive copper tape which has conductive adhesive to replace the strip that was on there from the factory to ground the cardboard RF shield to the can for the cartridge port. There was an inspected by 42 sticker which fell off when I opened the case. And I saved it, of course, since it was Inspector 42. And here I'm using a piece of thin double-sided tape to reapply it to the original location. Now we'll get that pesky little LED popped back into the top case. It's a little fiddly, but it's not too difficult. Then we'll get the keyboard mounted back into the top case using all 11 screws. And you notice here I have put a new piece of tape in place of that original nasty yellow tape. And now we'll install the top cover. I like to get the tabs lined up and then plug the connectors in and then rotate it down. 
And now with that little bit of filing we've done on the corners of the tabs, it closes nice and easy with no eerie creaking sounds. And of course we can't forget the three screws that hold the two case halves together. Here we have a pretty good overview of our system. We've got our Kevin Autumn power supply, the SD to 2 IEC from the future was 8-bit. We've got our Breadbin C64 that we refurbished. This is the S-Video cable that we made. There's an Epix fast load cartridge hiding back here. And over in this corner, if we can just see it, is an old uh, S-Video to HDMI converter box I had laying around. It actually does a fairly good job, even a little better than the Xtron on this particular C64. I've been using this TAC3 joystick that I refurbished to test this with. I thought about refurbishing the other one and sending that to my nephew as well, but in truth, these are not very good joysticks. So uh, I had some points saved up from Amazon and uh, I got him a couple um, of Hyperkin Troopers. Those are nice little Atari style joysticks that work really well. If we take a look at the picture we're getting out of this guy, this is not the best way to do it. Um, but you can see it looks really, really good. Uh, the SID sounds great on this system. It makes me very happy that it turned out so nice. Be really happy to send this to him. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode refurbishing this C64 for my nephew. It was a lot of fun and it makes me really happy it turned out so well. If you have any questions or comments, well, just leave them in that comment section down there below. I would love to hear from you. And thanks to everyone who helps support the Hey Bert channel through Patreon and other means. If you would like some more information about that, well, if you look down in the description below, there are some links and such. Well, until next time, bye.